Hey everybody, we're back here on Inside the Ropes and we are joined by, you know, the godfather of pro wrestling coverage, uh, Mr. Dave Meltzer. Dave, how you doing? I'm doing really good, Kenny. How you doing? I'm good, I'm good. We were talking off earlier about, you know, it's WrestleMania week and uh, there's so much stuff, so much stuff this week. It's it's unbelievable how much stuff there's. I mean, I think, don't, don't you think that a couple of years ago, because I just remember Orlando, it felt like there were way, way more shows, but... But be, but WWE is doing so much, so many more activities that it's almost like like before WWE did a certain number of activities in town, but now they're doing so much. Um, but I, I remember one the, the year I went to Orlando, it felt like there. I think that we added up like eighty shows during the week, and I don't think we're close to that this year. No, I think because you know you've talked about it on the podcast as well. I think because WWE are so hot right now, you know, there's more stuff happening and people are consuming more of that stuff than before. So. Um, but anyway, I wanted to ask you about a ton of stuff from WrestleMania in the past. So obviously there's the first WrestleMania where Hogan was, you know, the spearhead for the company. But I've heard you talk about before that when Vince was going to go national and he, he needed a guy, Hogan was one of three options of who he wanted. You talk about who he wanted um, to have that role as kind of his guy who could sort of take WWF the next level. Well, Hogan Hogan was by far the the the, the number one choice. Uh, I mean, that was the choice, and there was nobody else close. And I don't know that if he didn't have Hogan, that he would have made it. Um, it's it's a debatable point. I mean, like obviously he he had Jimmy Snuka was his top most popular guy, but Jimmy Snuka was uh, you know closing on forty and or forty actually and unstable in many ways so he, he was too much of a risk i think carrie von eric you know was if you didn't have hogan from a pure charisma standpoint carrie von eric was your guy but he was also you know like snooka he there was he was too much of a risk i mean to me hogan was the um you know he he was the choice you know i mean you could i i think by summer of 83 sergeant slaughter got very hot for a short period of time um but still, I don't think that he would have been the guy to be able to carry. Hogan was the right guy and the right right look and the right time. You know, it's just a whole bunch of factors. And it's, there's always like that. There's always a whole bunch of factors. But Hogan was the guy at that time. And, and he'd already, you know, been very, very strong as a draw for Vern Gagne. Exceptionally strong. I mean, him and Flair were really the two big draws. And Hogan was more Vince's type than Flair. And the main event of WrestleMania 1 is always a big talking point because it ended up being Hogan and Mr. T against Piper and Orndorff. But I just did a tour with Sergeant Slaughter, and he claims that initially there was talk of it being Hogan and Slaughter against Piper and Orndorff. Was there ever any truth to that, or is that just kind of his memory? Oh, um, God, I, you know, it was always Mr. T as far as I knew, because I don't think that they could have, I don't think that they could have had a show that successful without Mr. T, because Hogan, Hogan was very big with wrestling fans already, but he was not. He was basically an unknown outside of wrestling, even though he was he was kind of like, oh, yeah, the guy in Rocky three, you know, so there's a, people who saw Rocky three knew who he was. But it was like he wasn't Mr. T was the biggest thing on American television, the biggest thing. And, you know, when it came to all the mainstream press for the show, they, they did. It really wasn't Hulk Hogan. It was Cindy Lauper it was Mr. T and, you know, a little bit Muhammad Ali and Liberace and those people. It was it was the. Then that that's what got them the press, and they needed that press to draw in the level of audience to make that thing a success. So I, I mean, Mr. T was by far the most important. Uh, that you know, at that point, and without him, you know, I mean, I mean, just like on the M MTV shows and everything like that, when he um, when he did the running, you know, like everybody went nuts. It was Sarge; it would just be wrestling fans. So, so I. I don't think the show, you know, Sarge was very popular at the time, but I don't think um, he would have been the guy. And ob obviously he was gone by that time anyway. But, um, you know, they were, it was pretty clear that Mr. T was the the thing that made the first show click. And I mean, some people might, might be surprised. You know, you said this before that like a week out from WrestleMania 1, they were canceling certain closed circuit locations. Like they they weren't expect like they weren't doing well. In yeah, so, so basically... Yeah, what happened? They they, they booked about two hundred or so sit, uh, buildings, and um, the advances across the, there, there were exceptions. There were some places that had good advances, but most places had bad advances. As we learned from WrestleMania one, is that when it came to 
closed circuit, people didn't buy in advance like they did at arenas. So they were a week out, they were panicking. Um, I mean, it looked like this thing was going to be a disaster. You know, the stories of the company might go under, which I don't think is true. I mean, the uh, one of the, the, CEO, the CFO at the time has denied that story. You know, that Vince has always told that, you know, oh, if we didn't make this work, it would have gone, it would have gone south. But they canceled, um, I think it was 68, 68 out of the 201 locations were canceled the week before the show. So it was like, yeah, you know, the ones that were draw that were had the really bad advances. I mean, there were there were and there were plenty of locations that did, you know, two and three thousand people, um, which I mean, I guess they made money on them. You know, I mean, the show was a big money maker when it all was said and done. But a week out, uh, it did not look good. It wasn't until, um, you know, really the the, the thing with um, Hogan and on the, the, Richard, the Richard Belzer thing and the hosting the Saturday Night Live. And just Hogan and Mr. T running around doing media uh, in the last week, I think, really turned it around. And, you know, WrestleMania 3, we don't need to go over the attendance figure, which you've talked about so many times. But talk about Hogan and Andre as the main event. How important was it for that Andre match to happen? How big a deal was it, just in terms of WWE continuing the growth, if they didn't have Andre? That I, I mean, there was, there was no other match that could compare to it, because... Even though they had done the match, the match had been done many times. It had not been done in years, and it had not been done with Hogan as a babyface. Um, so, and and uh, you know, and it, and, it, and it had been done in WWE, but Andre was the babyface, and Hogan wasn't. Hogan was a, a a solid star, Battle of the Giants thing, but he was you know one tenth the star that he was in '87 in 1980ish when when they were doing the matches in WWF and. In the late seventies, when they did it in other territories, and then and and in the end in nineteen eighty, when they did it in other places as well in Japan and stuff, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, that was when when that match was announced. It was like okay, this is the biggest match that uh, you know. I, I I can't say I expected seventy eight thousand people at the show, um, but I did expect the all time record crowd. You know, the minute it was announced, like okay, I mean, the record crowd was you know probably forty five thousand. Um, you know, from from a Boston show in the uh, 30s. But uh, I did expect, you know, I expected 50, you know, maybe 40, 50 in that range, uh, maybe 60 if it was good. They obviously beat that. I mean, I remember talking to people and it was like, why did they book a stadium that big? They should have booked a 60,000 seat stadium and sold it out. Well, you know, they they booked a bigger stadium and they sold it out. So they was it was a big success or almost sold it out, whatever it was. It was very, very close. And do you think if, if, if Andre had, you know, we, Andre's health was deteriorating or his, or his kind of in-ring activity was deteriorating, if Andre hadn't been around, would that have affected the the, the growth of WWF or would it have kind of still went um, No, I mean, I mean, uh, I would only say slightly. I mean, WWF was already really strong after the first WrestleMania. I mean, that was really the turning point, I think. First WrestleMania, because I remember Ernie Ladd after the first WrestleMania said the war is over it's just that the other side doesn't know it yet um and he wasn't even affiliated with wwe at the time he was just in you know a uh you know an onlooker to the you know it was pretty smart when it came to the wrestling business but i remember him saying that to to one of my friends um you know to kind of to me as well not to me directly but just you know that that was his perspective you know that the, the after the first one by the third one i think everything was kind of in place um I think Hogan was a mega star going in. Was he bigger coming out? Yeah, probably a little bit. But I mean, he was already at the top. I, I, I and then you know, the, the Hogan Savage thing. I think would have been just as big with or without WrestleMania three. So, I mean, did it help? Yes. Did did the big crowd and all the publicity of the big crowd help the company? Yes. But in the long run, was the company going to end up? You know, as far as the direction and history of the company, the same way either way? Yes, it, it would have ended up exactly the same. And at WrestleMania 4, Randy Savage wins the tournament. He becomes the new WWF champion. But that wasn't the original plan. What was the original plan for WrestleMania 4 as to who was going to walk out as champ? Uh, I mean, the original plan was Ted DiBiase, and they made the change. And, I mean, it was funny because, you know, the, the logic was that you go with uh, Ted DiBiase, and then you have Randy challenge him, because those are the two big stars, Randy challenge him for the title and, and maybe beat him. And that way, the chase of Randy Savage is the story. Um, because we knew going out of the tournament, they were all the house shows were Randy Savage, Ted DiBiase, and I figured it would be a bigger draw with Randy chasing. As it turned out, um, they put Randy over and had Ted chasing after Ted had already lost to Randy in 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 the thing, 
And, um, you know, but they did, they did well. I mean, I can't say they didn't do well. Randy ended up being, um, I mean, I mean, I think Randy would have been a big star either way. I mean, it's big. I mean, obviously he was already a big star, but I mean, I think Randy would have been that level of star either way, whether he had won it at WrestleMania or whether he would have won it at SummerSlam. Um, but, you know, I guess when, um, uh, you know, the, it is the big, WrestleMania is the bigger stage. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, I think with hindsight, I would, I would say that they probably made the right move, but I don't know that like I'm, either move probably would have been fine though. And, you know, Hulk Hogan, there's always kind of these stories about how fragile his ego might be at certain points. How did Hogan feel about the idea of, obviously he was going to be off doing a movie, I think, at that point that summer. But how did he feel about Savage being the top babyface and being the champ? I don't know much other than it worked out well for him. Hogan and Savage have done great, great business, but Hogan won every single blow off. <laughs> so it's kind of like, yeah, this guy who's my understudy my top opponent but the guy i always beat wins while i'm gone um i didn't think that was that threatening for hogan and you know as soon as he came back um you know the first thing they did was build for hogan's return of that one um that one i will say that that i would not have had um hogan win i would have had hogan chase for a year i think that that would have made i think randy savage's champion for one more year would have been even bigger for business not you know but again their business was real strong because hogan when Hogan was not champion and he would go to these cities, he would still draw just as, a, you know, basically the same as champion. Randy, as not champion, was not going to draw as well as Randy as champion. Plus, you got the Hogan chase, which nobody had ever seen, and they were the perfect opponents and everything. So that that is one result. Like, I would look back and go, okay, I would have, you know. I mean, I you know, you hate to do a DQ at Mania, and they weren't going to book Hogan to lose. But I think that a Hogan chase of Savage would have been giant box office that year. And you know, it's Hogan Savage at WrestleMania Five. Some people say it's one of Hogan's best matches. Um, why do you think that's that's that that Mania main event was so successful? Well, God, they had that uh, one year build. You know, basically, you're not quite one year, but I mean, you could see that the seeds were there. I mean, like people knew for a year that this is kind of where they were going. And, you know, Randy had the credibility of being champion for a long time. And Randy was obviously, you know, big, big match. Randy Savage was was just a freaking all time great, you know, and perfect opponent for Hogan. And in, in you know, every every way, I think that uh, you go back historically, I mean, people will say Andre because of the one match. But if you're looking at like the combined totals of matches over history, the guy that Hogan drew the best would have been Randy Savage. And then the next year, it's Hogan and Warrior at WrestleMania 6. And can you talk talk about that week or what you remember about the build-up to that match? Because people uh, did not have high expectations for that, right? Well, the match itself, everybody was like, well, Hogan, you know, Hogan's fine. You know, he's fine. And Warrior's not good. So the match may not be great. Um, I, I thought the match ended up being really good. Um, but the, uh, you know, what's funny with that one was... You know, again, I went to some several house shows during that period. And during those shows, you know, they would build up, you know, WrestleMania and Hulk Hogan against Ultimate Warrior. And everybody would cheer Ultimate Warrior and blow, blow, blow Hulk Hogan's name. So it was kind of like, you know, Ultimate Warrior is new and cool. And Hulk Hogan, I don't say run its course, but, you know, people had seen it and they were ready for something new. That's what I was thinking all the way through. You know, it's like, this is going to be it. And, you know, we knew Warrior was going to win because we knew Hogan was, was leaving. So that wasn't a question. And it was just like, this is the the new Hulk Hogan. And the day, you know, whether it was Toronto, which was just a great Hulk Hogan city or what, you know, the day of the show, Hulk Hogan was more popular than Ultimate Warrior. And then when he lost, you know, he he uh, took the air out of Warrior the way he reacted to the loss. I mean, he made it all about himself, and um, which is brilliant for him. You know, I mean, it's when I saw that, you know, my thought was, is like, you know, Hulk Hogan is, you know, never knock Hulk Hogan smarts about knowing how to work. I mean, I always thought he was very, very smart business-wise and very smart knowing how to work. Unfortunately, at that time, as a team player, he should have just left that spotlight to Warrior. And, um, you know, because Warrior needed it more than we thought. Because when Warrior was champion, business did go down a lot. So, um, and, and, you know... You know, Warrior was supposed to be the next Hulk Hogan with a multi-year title reign, and obviously he didn't even last a year. 
how long was it after WrestleMania six that you got a sense that the the Warrior run was not one? Well, you know, the problem was, was, you know, it wasn't like it was a disaster or anything. But I mean, what well, well, was the first few with Papa Shango, which was such a bad idea anyway. So, I mean, when the, the gates came in for those shows, it was like, you know, they weren't, it's like by wrestling standards, they weren't bad. But by standards of Hulk Hogan, WWF championship, they were bad. And it was kind of like, wow, you know, you're you're comparing because Hogan was champion, you're comparing to the Hogan numbers. And the first thing you get is, man, this guy's not doing Hogan numbers. And yeah, his opponents, he didn't have the opponents that were credible at the level Hogan's were. But, you know, if Hogan did that terrible angle with Papa Shango, he, he would have drawn more than where Hogan was just a draw. That's that's all there was. And, um, you know, that's... And I think that that was really a part of so many of the problems with Warrior and Vince, because I think Warrior really envisioned himself... Um, this is what Hogan gets. I deserve the same. And Vince would look at it and go like, you know, we wanted you to be Hogan. We gave you a chance to be Hogan, but you're not Hogan, you know, and, and, you know, they're, 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 um, the 1991 falling out was based on that. And speaking of 91, Hogan and Slaughter headline resume at seven. I mean, younger people might not be able to appreciate that. I, you know, I probably don't appreciate it fully, but talk about, how bad was the reaction at the time to that story? I mean, there was definitely controversy about um, exploiting the Gulf War. And in hindsight, I mean, obviously, they, they touched a nerve in the wrong way. And they they thought it was the right way because it's like, you know, the, the thing of uh, any publicity is good publicity. And, you know, that's absolutely not true. <laughs> I mean, it's especially in wrestling. Bad publicity is bad publicity, even though, you know, because they got... They got more publicity for that, um, you know, WrestleMania seven with Slaughter than they'd gotten since probably WrestleMania three, mainstream maybe four, um, but um, you know, because because four was still built around Hogan and Andre, you know, in in the tournament. The um, but it, you know, it wasn't the right thing, and um, they had to move indoors, which again, um, you know, what what do you what do you say? You know, they they got ambitious. I, I, I mean, one of the things that they were looking at doing 100,000 people at, uh, um, what was it, at the Col- L.A. Coliseum. Yeah, the Memorial Coliseum. Um, and, you know, the I, I think that in Pontiac, Michigan, because you had Toronto being so close and you had so Detroit, obviously, being so close and so many big cities, Columbus, Ohio, and all that, that were not too far that WrestleMania and 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 whatever it was, it was a big big deal there. And you also had Hogan and Andre, which was bigger than Hogan and Slaughter. You come to Los Angeles, which is seen super. I, mean, I, I know people like in Los Angeles, they go like, look, and and WrestleMania was not nearly as big culturally as it is now. So the whole thing was is like, look, we've seen Super Bowls, we've seen World Series, we've seen the Olympics. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's what's WrestleMania compared to that? So the the community did not get excited by that wrestlemania at all and they you know they didn't sell enough tickets and had to move it indoors um i don't think that it was a backlash as much i mean a lot of the negative publicity was a backlash to the hogan slaughter angle for sure but i think that the other problem that people don't talk about is it it, wrestlemania just wasn't that big in los angeles that you know that market it wasn't as big a deal like if they did it now in los angeles like they did so far yeah of course you know you know, easy sellout, you know, two, two nights or whatever, you know, or close, um, you know, but that then, you know, it's, it's, it's WrestleMania like that. This version of WrestleMania didn't really get the stadium version. Didn't really get big until, I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, 2000, even after 2001, there were a couple weak ones, but, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a different WrestleMania once they were regularly going to stadiums and, and when people started trap when they became traveling shows which i think that's the whole key to now because you know like when i'll just give an example because i know the numbers when they came to santa clara 75 percent of those people were from you know way far away you know like within you know more than four or five hour drives um it's it's people it was a fly-in thing and and every year that's why they get so much money for wrestlemania because the home city they don't care about the locals that go you know that they're gonna you know drive to the show and go back and eat at their home the whole idea is to bring in tens of thousands of tourists, have them stay at the hotels, have them eat at the restaurants, and and you know something like that. That's where the big money 
for getting WrestleMania is from tourists, and WrestleMania was not really a tourist show until, um, I, don't, I don't know, maybe 2001 or something. Now, was there ever any, you know, when they brought Slaughter back in August of 1990 to do that angle, I mean, if they hadn't brought Slaughter back, did they have any other ideas or was... Okay, okay, I'm warrior. You know, I mean... I mean, I mean that was that was the natural one because the first match was such a success. I mean, I think they didn't really want to do it again because, um, at you know originally it would be um, you know Hogan losing again, which they didn't need to do, but it might. Have been. But as as the year went on, when it was clear that Warrior wasn't the answer, um, yeah, that would have been your answer, Hogan Warrior, and Hogan gets his win back and would go back to Hogan again. Which, you know, is what they did with, they just put Slaughter in the middle, you know. And perhaps they would have found another heel to go in the middle rather than do Hogan Warrior. But Hogan Warrior, when when they did the first Hogan Warrior, I mean, I thought the very obvious next year is the rematch in whatever shape or form. Because the first match was so good that the rematch, I thought, would have been as good or, or, or better. You know, I, mean, I mean, as far as draw-wise. I know you've probably answered this question a million times, but I have to ask it. WrestleMania 8. Why Why did Hogan and Slayer not happen? It feels like it would have been an organic thing. He came in. Um, it, 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 it didn't run its course. I mean, like, Flair wasn't drawing with Hogan, um, you know, by January. Why do you, you know, so it was kind of, it was, and, and Sid was, Sid and Hogan, I mean, look, they did Hogan, they were, they were doing Hogan and, and uh, Roddy Piper versus Sid and Ric Flair matches everywhere. And the heat was Hogan and Sid, not Hogan and Flair anymore. And Vince reacted to that. To that, um, Hogan, you know, Hogan and Flair had it had WrestleMania been in November. Yeah, of course, Hogan and Flair would have been huge. But the problem was, is the timing, the time. You know, the Hogan Flair wasn't Flair wasn't booked right. You know, they wouldn't. They were they were still stuck in this wrestling war, and they didn't give Flair the acknowledgement you know, of of being like a special thing. In fact, they went out of their way not to. You know, I mean, Hogan would do promos. Oh, everyone thinks this is a big match. To me, it's just another match. That's what he was doing at the house shows. And it's like, that's not a way to build a match. You know, they they were so, um, you know, it was that era where, where they hated their competition so much that they, um, you know, ruined their own storyline because they didn't want to acknowledge Ric Flair at that level. And, um, you know, by November, December, Ric Flair wasn't at that level anymore because of because of that. It wasn't, you know, and, I mean, yeah, the 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 feud had, had already stopped drawing well uh, in a lot of markets, but I think some of that was because it was never presented as special as it should have been. It's WCW did a much better job, yeah, than than of, of Hogan Flair than than WWF did much better. You couldn't even you can't even compare the two really. Yeah, the, yeah, it was way better than WCW. Uh, WrestleMania nine is kind of bandied around one of the worst WrestleManias of all time. Why was WrestleMania 9, like, why did it end up being so bad? Because what, what do you remember in the months and weeks leading up to it as to why they went in the direction they did? Um, man, I don't know. I think that just the whole atmosphere there, you know what I mean? Um, you know, I... Yeah, some nights some nights the matches aren't that good, and um, I mean some of the you know the WrestleManias of Trump Towers weren't that good either. But but yeah, I know a lot of people think nine was the worst of all of them. Um, you, certainly, you, I thought it's near the bottom though. Yeah. Did you at the time? Because obviously Yoko Vina had come in in November of ninety two. Did you think it was too soon to put him in that WrestleMania headline spot? Um. Mm, that's you know what choice did they have? You know what I mean. It was a. It was. I always think it's a weird choice that on that show, Randy Savage is on commentary. You know, they've got Randy Savage, and they're not putting him in. You know, in something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the thing with Vince is, is that Vince, Vince, like soft forty is this. It's which is funny now. Vince soft forty is the stage that, like, you know, it's forty years old. They're done. They can't draw anymore. And um, yeah, I mean, that really hurt Randy in the sense of, um, you know, he did with Brandy, did with Piper to a degree with Hogan even. Um, it's like, you know, it's like, okay, they're 40, you know, ship them out. You know what I mean? And uh, um, I, I think the hindsight shows that with Randy, that was that was a mistake because Randy had some uh, great drawn years in WCW too. Uh, WrestleMania 11 was, you know, they had all the celebrities. They were trying to do everything to make it a big deal. 
and it was Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam in the main event. Why was Bam Bam the guy they chose to face Lawrence Taylor, and why did why did it such a big success? The match. Well, I mean, like number one, you needed a guy who was a really really good worker because Lawrence Taylor, you know, I mean, needed needed that. And Bam Bam had a great look, you know. I mean, like for the general public, you know, what I mean, it's like this. You know, 360 pound guy with tattoos with his face. And Bam Bam, I mean, the key to this was the ability to say, you know, which was Bam Bam's role that, yes, WrestleMania, I mean, yes, wrestling is, is not real. No, they, you, you don't use these words, obviously, but you try to convey this feeling of this match. Yes, wrestling is not real, but I hate this guy. And once I'm in the ring with him, who's going to stop me from fighting him for real? And it was kind of like, oh, Lawrence Taylor badass football player because in, in, in our country, you know, we didn't have MMA and we didn't see football players go to MMA and get their ass kicked and things like that. Um, we only, we thought like Lawrence Taylor, badass football player, you know what I mean? Like baddest dude of all. And now he's going against this badass wrestler who's going to fight him for, who's, who, who might shoot on him for all we know, even though obviously that was never going to happen. And that was the dynamic they were shooting for. Um, I don't know that they had any, I mean, I thought Bam Bam was the right opponent just because of that. Um, you know, because again, this is, this was one that was sold to the general public and not to the wrestling fans. I mean, Bam Bam had not been pushed to wrestling fans quite at that level at all, but Bam Bam's look and the fact that he really was a great worker, which they needed, I think that was the combination of why they picked him. And I, I heard you say in an interview that apparently they were originally planning to have Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam team up down the line and do yes. a follow-up match. I mean, why, why do you, man, I mean... Why did Lawrence did, Lawrence Lawrence got so much bad publicity for doing it? He never wanted to do it again. Um, that that you know, what I mean, that was basically it. And um, you know, there were people. I mean, how ridiculous is this? There were people going like, ah, he did a fake wrestling match. He should be disqualified from going into the Hall of Fame. I mean, in football, the Football Hall of Fame, and it's just like, geez, this is ridiculous. You know, how, you know, lots of guys did wrestling matches that are in the Football Hall of Fame. You know, Bronco Nagurski was a freaking world champion in wrestling. You know, but. Um, Leona Molini was a big, big star, you know, but, but the, the sports reaction, I mean, it was so negative to Taylor going in, but he went through with it. But then after, yeah, he, um, he didn't want anything to do with it again because he was getting so much negative publicity for, for doing it. And, you know, one of the best WrestleMania matches of all time is Austin and Brett at WrestleMania 13. And I mean, I, mean, I think the best probably. And it was never meant to happen. That was never the plan. I mean, that, oh. like, no, no, Brett was supposed to wrestle Sean and Austin was supposed to wrestle David Boy Smith. And um, yeah, Sean wasn't in that WrestleMania. And uh, uh, that was a fallback. <laughs> and it ended up being, uh, you know, I mean, what? One of the most important matches in WWE history because it springboarded Austin, um, you know, into a level of star that, you know, they never had since Hogan. And, um, and in many ways... Um, you know, set up, you know, it took a year to happen, but it set up a turnaround in that company. I mean, that company had a giant boom period once Austin really got settled, you know, obviously with Vince and everything. But um, yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny when you look back at history. I mean, it's really funny about, you know, some of the things that were really big in history were planned, but so many were accidents that just happened that nobody knew about. And Austin was probably the most fortunate accident that WWE ever had because, when Vince brought him in, Vince saw him as a mid-card guy, you know, who's a good worker and and couldn't do much with him. And, um, you know, he ended up being, you know, like him and Hogan. I mean, he was the biggest peak star that they ever had, although Hogan was bigger longer. And and Rock, obviously, because he became a movie star, became bigger. But as far as peak wrestling drawing card, you know, Austin was the biggest one they ever had. I mean, it's not that it's, it's, it's the original plan that happened in Brett say Sean. Do you think Austin would have still found a way to to get where he needed to be, or do you think that match was 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 the crucial part to sort of turn around for him? That's a great question, and I mean the re reality is, is I don't have a great answer. I mean, it is certainly possible, um, but it's for sure not a lock. You know, I mean, it's like. Um, you know, Austin was really good and the people probably would have got behind him. But then you take away that whole summer, you know, which was Bret Hart and Steve Austin, you know, with the, with, you know, the shows in Canada and the shows in the United States. And that was a big deal of Austin's growth, too. 
And, um, you know, I just think, um, you know, in the Austin turn, done the right way. Um, it's like, I, I don't, I, you know, it, it, it's possible. It's, it's, um, but I, 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 I could never say for sure, because that was, to me, that was still the key moment was that double turn match at uh, WrestleMania. The following year, WrestleMania 14, by that point, Montreal's happened, Brett's gone. If Brett had stayed and him and Vince had figured it out, what would Brett Hart have been doing at WrestleMania 14? I don't know. Um, I mean, Vince's idea was absolutely Shawn Michaels losing to Steve Austin by that point. Um, so as far as Brett, I know he'd have been in the card in a big match, but I don't know what the match would have been. And talk about the the Mike Tyson deal and how that came about, and you know, because that really helped propel the Austin thing. Yeah, I think that kicked off Austin even bigger because now I think that when he did that angle with with uh, Mike Tyson, you know, you had mainstream covering him, and people didn't know who he was, but then they did, and especially because the key was is that like usually when you have a badass guy from another sport and they work with a heel in wrestling, you know, the heel's job is to power away. And and a lot of people in wrestling always hate like like you know like you know like uh, hated that because the idea is like he's coming into our world. Why do we have to make him look bigger than us? Like a football player would come in, and all the wrestlers would you know a football star would come. All the wrestlers would sell for him. You know what I mean? And in this case, you had Mike Tyson, who you know at the time his reputation was the baddest man in the world, and here Austin is standing up to him and and ready to go after him and not backing down at all. And um, that dynamic was, uh, you know, you're seeing this this guy who's not backing down to Mike Tyson. And then combined, Austin was such a great talker. And I think that all that really propelled him. Like the Brett thing got him to a level with wrestling fans. And then the uh, Mike Tyson thing, uh, that just, you know, that got him to the level where it, you know, it wasn't right away, but it turned the company around. I mean, I will attribute that turnaround. I mean, obviously, I think Vince becoming a character was a big part of it, too. And WCW self-destructing certainly was part of it. But um, the rise of Austin, I think, would be uh, the biggest thing of all. And I mean, is it true, the story that WCW passed on using Mike Tyson before that? Okay, so so the deal was that, um, I guess you could say that, you know, I mean, Bischoff denies it, but this is, this. I mean, I was getting this on a daily basis from, from Zane Breslov, who was in the middle of it. So he had made the verbal deal with WWE, and Tyson's people came to Zane and then maybe maybe others as well and go, you know, we're getting three and a half million. If you top it, and they've already shot the angle. Okay, they've already shot the angle, but they haven't signed the contract, which, you know, in hindsight, in that era was uh, quite dangerous. But WWE figured three and a half million, he's, he's with us for that one shot. So they went to WCW and said, if you beat the number, we will go. And Eric just thought that three and a half million. Of course, like I said, he'll deny the story. But, you know, this is what Zane told me, like, because he was all excited. We can, you know, think about it. You're the promoter of all the shows and you've got a chance. WWE has done this deal with Tyson. They're already done the thing on TV and they haven't signed the contract. We can steal him. I mean, what's the bigger thing? And and Eric was would have been into stealing him, but he just thought from a fiscal responsibility. He thought, as m- most of us thought, that that three and a half million was just way too much, and he wouldn't be worth it. Well, as it turned out, he was worth it, um, because the WrestleMania, you know, WrestleMania went from um, the the Brett and Steve Austin WrestleMania, which was uh, I guess Undertaker said was the actual main event, but that was the the biggest match. That did two hundred thirty seven thousand buys, which you know is. You know, unbelievable that a WrestleMania would do that, but it did. You know, I mean, on, on the downside, is a bad number. And then the next year with Tyson, you know, refereeing Austin and Shawn Michaels, they did seven hundred thirty thousand. And um, you know, I'm not saying Mike Tyson was responsible for all of that, but he was responsible for a hell of a lot of that. The next year, WrestleMania 15, Austin Rock was the in their first WrestleMania match. But I always am interested in the story of Mick Foley at that WrestleMania because he. Him and Rock were trading the title for the first couple of months of the year. And there's a story that Foley was initially going to be in that WrestleMania main event. Is that true? And I, I never, I never, I never um, heard that seriously because Rock was, they always saw Rock as their long-term guy. And when Rock and Foley were going at it, you know, it was always like Mick Foley's going to be a great guy to put Rock over. Um, it was never, 
you know, it's like just their mentality of what a star looks like. Mick Foley was never that guy. I mean, Mick Foley would have never even been in WWE if it wasn't for Jim Cornette and Jim Ross just pushing and pushing and pushing. Mostly Jim Ross, but but Jim Cornette as well. Um, he wouldn't have been in. And, and, you know, Vince had turned the guy down year after year after year. Every year, I think that Foley would send a resume to Vince and Vince would turn him down. And even when he finally agreed after Ross really stuck his neck out to get him in, you know, he said, it's going to break your heart, Jim, that you worked this hard to get this guy in when he fails. I mean, Vince, he never, like, Mick Foley, you know, I mean, I'm sure they're they're on, in, on, on you know, at times on great terms and everything. But Mick Foley was never Vince's kind of guy. He became a big, big star and a legend and everything there. But, and Rock always was. You know, Rock was the prototype. You know, what... You know, good looking, good body, great athlete, good talker, great talker. You know, I mean, he was the prototype of what they wanted. And, you know, if he hadn't gone to the movies, um, you know, Rock would have been the number one guy in that company for the next 10 plus years. You know, especially when Austin was going there and it, there's nobody, you know, it, it, it probably seen it never would have gotten to that level if Rock was still there because it would have been at nor, nor Triple H. It would have been Rock. It would have been Rock by leaps and bounds over everybody else. At uh, WrestleMania 17, I've got to ask you the question. Why did they turn Steve Austin? What was the reason in their mind? Uh, you know, a lot of that, I mean, I remember I remember having those discussions on a regular basis and writing this one because, yeah, you know, I was so against this. This was my thought. Steve Austin had brought, like, like the only ones I could compare Steve Austin with were, were Bruno San Martino and Hulk Hogan. And yes, Hulk Hogan did end up successful as a heel with WCW, but that's because people were tired of him. And also, WC, there, were, there were a lot of dynamics in WCW that made it work. But also, Hulk Hogan was more this fantasy character. Steve Austin was like real. So he was closer to me than, Bru than, than like Bruno. And you would never turn Bruno heel. And if you did turn Bruno heel, it would have been an absolute, the worst thing you could have ever done, which is why they never even considered it. With Austin, Austin had brought, by this point in time, you know, by 2001, Austin had brought in, you know, millions of people who were not wrestling fans who got, got in watching Austin and Vince. And Austin and Vince was real to them. And you can do anything you want. The one thing you should never do is have Austin side with Vince. Unless Vince was a baby face and needed Austin's help, but not as a heel. And so they, you know, and then, you know, we, you know, everything went down right after that. But uh, as far as like what was going on then is, um, you know, um, Triple H was supposed to go babyface. They thought Rock, they'd have more with Rock than they got because Rock did a lot more movie work. Triple H decided he wasn't going to go babyface, but that was going to be the program. And Austin wanted to go heel. There was um, a match in Vegas, um, the pay-per-view match, where Austin wrestled Triple H. And there were, you know, it was not the people booed. Austin, but there were boos. It was very much similar to when Austin wrestled Bret in Madison Square Garden um, in, um, well, this would be 96, right? And at, uh, was it Survivor Series? Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, you could hear people cheering Austin, but they weren't booing Bret. Bret was still like probably at 75%, but Austin clearly had a contingent. And then it was like kind of like, hey, we should make him babyface. Same thing happened actually with Rock and Triple H in Madison Square Garden in the ladder match. Where it's like, although in that one, actually, the people really did cheer Rock the heel over Triple H the baby face. But in this case, Triple H was the the um, the heel. He wrestled that two out of three match with Austin. He won it clean with the idea of when Austin beats, you know, when Austin is the champion, um, you've got the natural Austin Triple H match. Okay, that that's why he lost. But Triple H did get some cheers. And Austin's thing was, is like, let's just flip it. Austin wanted it that way. And um, the people I know in WWE, all the Triple H's time, he's going to be the baby face. Austin's going to be the heel. And it's like, no, don't do it. You know, especially because it was with Rock. And even though Rock was super popular, people had a much easier time. Rock, Rock never needed to be the baby face. He could be a baby face. He could be a heel. There was not, not the connection guttural connection that the fans had with rock that they had with austin even though rock was this larger than life superstar it's a different dynamic rock was closer to hogan austin was closer to bruno you don't turn bruno and they did and um you know i mean that's what happened but yeah especially you know especially doing it in texas you know and and then having him side with vince it was just like 
you know, Austin himself goes, you know, I mean, he said this before. He goes, you know, I should have just like been instinctive and just stunned Vince. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because that and, and been cheered like crazy. And, and then you go right back to where you were, you know. But um, yeah, I just every week when when that thing was going and they were turning Austin heel on rock, it was just kind of like, this is this is not going to work. The next year, WrestleMania 18, they bring in the NWO, Hogan Hall and Nash to be the heels to go up against Austin and Rock. I mean, obviously, Hogan would basically turn babyface within a month. Did you ever think that angle with the NWO could work? We, did you ever think the fans would legitimately do Hogan, given that he'd not been there for like nine years? Yeah, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting the um, Hogan reaction. Um, I mean, I expected, I actually expected that whole NWO ang- angle to be much bigger than it was. Um, you know, but... Um, Why do you think it wasn't that big? What do you think it was about it? Um, I don't think Kevin Nash and Scott Hall got over it. That is, is big, especially Scott Hall. Scott Hall was a mess, so I don't think that that helped. I think that the way... Honest, I, you know, the way they were... I think that, you know, again, I think the biggest thing was Vince is bringing the NWO in. It's like the NWO needed to come in as outsiders like they did in WCW. Um, and Vince didn't want it to look like he wasn't in control. I think that it actually that was the kill the, the killer. It was very much like Flair. You know, it's like Flair needed to come in, not be part of the WWE show. He needed to be something separate. This this outsider coming in, and the NWO absolutely needed to be these outsiders coming in to, um, you know, go against Vince. You know, kind of like what, what you would do in Japan, like Jerry Jarrett would have done it. Um, and you know, Vince being against them, as opposed to, hey, I'm Vince and I'm bringing back the NWO. It's just like, oh, great. So I think that that was the biggest issue in it. And then, you know, again, nostalgia is nostalgia. The people loved Hogan. You know, he'd been gone for a long time. They remembered the good times with Hogan. He was just old enough to where it wasn't like he'd he'd um, worn out his welcome. And and you know, you you go through you go through phases. You go through your hot phase. And then you go down, and then if you go away for a couple of years, you'd get your nostalgia room. I remember with, um, I'll give you an example of this, is um, when the Road Warriors were really, really big in Japan. And um, then, you know, times changed. They weren't quite as hot in Japan anymore. And But they were still, you know, they made a lot of money in Japan. They wanted to go. And I remember, you know, Fumi Saito is my very close friend who was also friends with, with Hawk and Animal. And... Um, and he said, no, go away for three years. Go away for three years, which they didn't do. Go away for three years, four years, because when you come back, it'll be gigantic and you'll have your nostalgia run. You know, But if you stay, you can't have your nostalgia run because you never went away. So um, it was funny. I never really thought of it that way, but that was a great lesson. And with Hogan, it was his nostalgia run that time. And you know, that, that year, they have the Rock and Hogan match. People think of it as a kind of classic. But, I mean, Austin Hogan seemed like the obvious way to go when he came in. Mm-hmm. Why did Austin and Hogan not happen? Because Rock wanted it and Austin didn't. Austin did not push for the match. Rock wanted the match. And so um, that's the one they went with. Austin and Hogan would have been a bigger match. Although it would have been big either. He obviously was big with Rock too. But Austin would have been the bigger match of the two. But Austin, you know... Um, and, and I would I would guess that he would say, like, God, what was I thinking? But at the time, it was just kind of like, I think Austin's idea was, is, you know, I want a, a, I want a great match and I'm going to get it with Hogan, not realizing that, uh, you know, that night in Toronto, <laughs> an average match would have been a fantastic match just because of the nature of the, 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 the dynamic. You know, Austin and Hogan would have been great, even if they had a what would be a crappy match for any t- other two people in the world. It would have been great because the 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 interest and the you know the the magic or whatever it is of the biggest star before you know it's the you know that's that was the real dream match you know and Rock was you know Rock was one B uh, um, and it was still a dream match but um, yeah I mean Rock wanted it Rock was Rock had no problem with it I mean Austin was gonna you know Austin would have beaten Hogan but I think he just just didn't maybe he didn't feel like he could have a great match with him, not realizing that he didn't, you know, by his standards of a great technical wrestling match that he could do, he didn't have to do it that night. That night was that night would have been easy work. I heard you say that Austin, one of the reasons he didn't want the match with Hogan is he had issues with him in 2002. What were the issues at that point between them? You mean from WCW? Or is it from WCW? He's the- yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you remember you remember when 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 um 
you know, when, and I, you know, I don't know how, you know, you'd have to talk to Austin as far as like how much, but if you remember, but still, you know, Austin was a U.S. champion when Hogan came in. And the first thing Hogan did was, um, you know, put the title on Duggan, right? Who was, you know, and, and Austin was basically phased out from when Hogan game came there. So, you know, you had that dynamic too, that, you know, Austin was a star Hogan, not, it's not just Hogan came in, but Hogan came in with all of his buddies and here Austin had been there for years and years and was, you know, a great worker on his way up. He just got faced all the way down. And, um, you know, I mean, ultimately it's Eric, but, you know, Hogan was, Hogan had an awful lot of control. And, you know, I mean, Austin losing that match to um, Duggan in seconds, I mean, that was probably the Hogan call. And, you know, from there, Austin was, you know, never that strong in WCW again. Uh, WrestleMania 19, it always fascinates me because the buy rate was so bad for that WrestleMania. But it had so many big names on it. Michaels was back, you know, Hogan, Rock, Austin, Lesnar, Angle, Jericho, all these people. Why do you think WrestleMania 19 didn't deliver on pay per view in number? I think it was built all around Vince against Hogan. And I think that people didn't buy Vince as a WrestleMania main event. Even though he could talk it, I think that they just didn't see him as a. But, Vince, when Vince would do singles main events on pay per view, they really didn't do that well as, as as much as you would think they would. Like like Vince was a great television antagonist, but it wasn't like in a wrestling match it was going to be that big. And you know, even though there were other matches that were pushed as the main event, the whole show was really built around Vince and Austin. And and um, I mean I'm I mean um. Um, was 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 that was that Vincent Austin or was that um Vince? I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean Vincent Hogan, right, right, right. Yeah, and lost my train of thought. Yeah, it was built around Vincent Hogan, and um, I don't think that um, yeah, I don't think that that was uh, I just yeah, it didn't really um, it didn't really click at that level, you know, to be a WrestleMania main event, and they like I said, they built everything around that one, thinking that one was the draw, and it just wasn't the right match. And, um, yeah, and and maybe Hogan's, you know, your nostalgia run also only lasts a certain amount of time. And, um, you know, that may be part of it, too. You know, maybe Hogan was a little bit past that point, and Vince wasn't the right guy. You, you talked a little bit about Rock, you know, getting into movies and all that kind of stuff. And he had the, he came back to WrestleMania 20, did the tag match with Foley against Evolution. But then at the end of that year, they let his contract run. And he just, he was gone for years. I mean... What, what, how do you let the Rock's contract go? I was in the middle of that one. Um, <laughs> um, you'd have to ask Vince. You know, you got to remember, um, you know, number one, Rock wasn't, um, you know, he was trying to transition away from wrestling. So that's part of it. Number two, you know, Vince thought that when rock played the gay character in in that one movie that he was just committing um suicide because vince you know being older um you know his understanding of that of of what the world was at the time was was dated and you know it's like that whole macho thing and he's got to be this macho guy and that's what his role needs to be needs to be john wayne and, and stuff and so Dwayne's idea was i'm gonna prove myself to be an actor and i'm gonna do um, you know, I'm going to show my versatility. I'm not going to just play big badass, which is funny because in the end, uh, the big badass was, was, uh, Dwayne's, you know, most successful acting roles box office wise, but, you know, he wanted to be a serious actor. Vince thought he was going about it all wrong. So there was a lot of tension there. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, his contract wasn't renewed. There was no big thing. One day they just, it ended and, um, they were at odds for a couple months and then, WrestleMania, the next year, Rock went to WrestleMania, met with Vince. Vince goes, it was a clerical error. And, you know, I think they both wanted to be on good terms. So, you know, like when I was told, he said it was a clerical error, you know, my thought was, oh, yes. I mean, I'm sure that Dwayne Johnson, The Rock's contract expiring, was a clerical error. But, you know, you just live and, you know, in the end, they signed a new deal and then they were back. They were back in business, uh, you know. Well, but they they didn't sign a deal right away. But but they they got back on good terms at, at the the next WrestleMania. 
Uh, Donald Trump came in for WrestleMania 23, did the Battle of the Billionaires. How easy was it for them to put together a deal where he would come in and he would even get physical? Um, talk about them putting that deal together with Trump. You know, I don't know about the negotiations, but Trump, you know, obviously um, he was, a, you know, not as big as he is now, of course, but he was <laughs> he was a big, big star. And I mean, the thing was, is like Vince wasn't going to wrestle. But Vince's hair and Trump's hair, that's what sold that WrestleMania. It's like, I think everybody, you know, the idea of this billionaire, even though Vince was not a billionaire at the time, but but he was relatively rich. You know, he was very, very rich at the time. Um, the idea that you knew Vince is getting his head shaved. This, you know what I mean? Like this guy who you watched as a heel on television, um, he's got all this heat. He's getting his head shaved because you know Trump's not getting his head shaved. And I think, and that's what sold it, you know, that heat. So, um, yeah, that one worked. That was, uh, you know, of all the angles they did in WrestleMania history, um, that probably uh, money-wise, you know, other than Rock and Cena, I think it was the most money-wise uh, angle that they ever did. So, at WrestleMania 25, obviously, Undertaker and Sean had, you know, an amazing WrestleMania match. I do want to bring up the star rating, with you about it because I know people always get on you about this so mm-hmm. that match from you got 4.75 stars right so just yes. to set the record straight you've always said that's a great match right so it's not the year 4.75 4.75 m- many years many years is match of the year and that match actually won match of the year um, so, my, so my question to you about that is what what, what I, was, you- I was so close I was look I was so close on 5 and as far as um, what, what, I mean what it was not get 5 you think like what was the what was the I, I mean I mean to, to to me five was a, a standard that uh, it's, it's not I mean, it's never about what didn't it was just like when it was over it's like when it's over it's like man this is like four and three quarters or five and I go well if I say it's four and three quarters and four five and I've done this for many matches that means four and three quarters five means I mean for me to go five means I have to go in there and go like. You know, like this is whatever, and I, you know, you know, like look, if you said five, I mean, I was pretty damn close on five. I, I, there's not really, there's not a real reason. Like people go, oh, it's because of this thing that happened in the match. And it's like, nah, it was just, you know, you got to remember, I've seen all those Japanese matches, and they're better, much better. And you know, this was this was a hell of a match, though. You know, but it was just, um, I mean, there's not really a, a, a you know, again, four and three quarters is a, is a great, great rating. You know, I mean, people now, it's just like, how do you give that thing four and three quarters? Like some whatever. And it's just like, you know, um, it's still, you know, like anything over four is a great rate. So I thought, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I thought I thought it was, um, I know, one of the best WWE matches I'd seen. I did not think it was as good as uh, Bretton Austin, you know, if you're going to go with that comparison. Um I mean, moves wise, you could argue it, but I don't think uh, motion story it was as good. Um, you know, I could talk about, but I'd already made my decision. You know, talking with uh, uh, two of the greatest wrestlers of all time that night after that match, discussing that match, and neither of them thought it was as good as I did. Um, and you know, they're probably like if you think of two great friends of mine that were two of the greatest wrestlers of all time, you might even figure out who they were. But one of them basically said that uh, any one of us could have done this match, but we would never would because we were, you know, basically doing everyone's finish. That's all we did. And the other one was just like, you know, what was the deal? My turn, your turn, my turn, your turn, which was actually maybe one of my thoughts, too, was that um, it didn't have the unpredictability to me because I just saw everything coming when it was coming, which is maybe my fault, you know, as far as um, because I like something that. Like, like for me, like, like the the ultimate super match is not. I can predict everything. It's like I am stunned. These guys are, are taking my level of watching a match and twisted it, but made it successful. Like they've done things I wouldn't think of, but it works to me. That's like that's where you get like a super match. This one was, yeah, I saw everything coming. And it was great. And I gave it four and three quarters. And I could have given it five. I mean, it's like it's not a ne- negative. I, I still think it's one of the best matches in WrestleMania history. Uh, WrestleMania 30, the end of the streak, and the Daniel Bryan, you know, will he, won't he, 
situation. With the streak ending and Brock winning it, did you see that coming and what was your reaction when it happened? I did not see the streak ending. <laughs> I don't know if anyone did, but if you're asking me, I was freaking stunned. But when he hit that last F5 before the three count, I did go, oh my God. Because I just thought he did so many F5s. Wasn't that the third one, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like when he hit the first one, it's like, it's not the finish for sure. Hit the second one, it's kind of like, Man, but it's not the finish because he ain't losing. When he's the third one, is, and, and they're that deep into the match, it was kind of like, oh, my God, he's beating him, and he did. So I would say I figured it out um, like the second it happened, but until then there was like 0% chance in my mind that uh, Brock Lesnar was winning that match. Um, you know, and um, you know, and I know, boy, I know if you remember afterwards, so many people in wrestling were, were furious at that, going like, he should never lost. He should never lost. And I don't know. I mean, I, and I, I, I asked, I didn't, I never talked to Vince about it, but I did talk to people very close to Vince and I go like, what was the deal? And it was, <clears throat> that might've been Undertaker's last match. Obviously it didn't end up being that, but we, we were afraid this is his last match. And um, we, we wanted, you know, somebody to beat him because what's the point of the streak unless somebody wins the, you know, beats the streak. And Brock was the right guy. Somebody else would have self-destructed under it. It would have been, you know, Brock was the guy. And so that was the deal that year. And Brock, you know, I, I know Brock pushed pretty hard for it too. Um, just a couple of last questions. So obviously when COVID hit, right before WrestleMania 36, you know, they had to do the, the show in the empty performance center. But Bray Wyatt and John Cena did that Firefly Funhouse match, which is kind of insane that they put that together in like a week when the yeah. world gets shut down. Uh, what, what did you think of that? And what was kind of the reaction from people you were speaking to about that match? The Firefly Funhouse? Yeah. It's very, very divisive. Some people loved it and some people absolutely hated it. Um, I, you know, I wasn't a fan of it. I was, I mean, I, I, I mean, I know it was creative as hell. It just wasn't my cup of tea. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. It, it's one of those things where now, now the Undertaker match, you know, with with the the, the cinematic match, I, I love that. I thought that was fantastic. Do you think? I mean, this is a just a hypothetical question, but do you think if if, if COVID hadn't happened and Undertaker and AJ Styles had had a match in a stadium, do you think Undertaker still had it at that point to have a, a memorable match, or do you think in some ways the cinematic match was? Well, the, I think the cinematic match certainly was much better. Um, could he have pulled it together for one match against a guy who wrestles at the level of AJ Styles? I think so. I don't think it would be as good as the one that they had, but I don't think it would have been a bad match. I think it would have been a a very, very good match. AJ, you know, that's AJ at the top of his game, and AJ's a super, super talent. And Undertaker, you know, for one match a year, you know, the guys, you know, I, I, I think he would have been fine. I mean, granted, I mean, some of his matches late in his career were not the greatest, but, but um, you know, AJ was at the level where I think it would have been, I think, whatever it was, I mean, but what they did and what it what it ended up being was, I think, much better than it would have been as a regular match and much more memorable and much more fitting, you know, farewell to. Was there ever, I mean, just, was there ever any conversations you remember about ideas that Speak was going to end before Brock? Was there ever any kind of people who it was close that they were maybe going to have somebody break it? Well, at the beginning, it wasn't even a big deal. You know, it, it took on a life of its own after a while. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd heard rumblings that, 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 but not not when it was happening. But I had heard rumblings afterwards that they had considered Randy Orton, but the streak wasn't as big a deal then at, at the time. But um, and it's probably for the best that they didn't do it because the streak, as, as years went on, the streak became the biggest thing in WrestleMania. You know, and, um, you know, some years when they didn't have as strong, um, you know, matches, the streak was was big enough to carry the whole show, so I think it was fortunate that they didn't make that decision for for the Randy for Randy Orton. But um, after you know, in the later years, you know, like with, when it was Edge and Ric Flair and some of these people, you know, I mean, well, Ric Flair was earlier, but but in some of the later years, I don't think it was even considered. And you know, by the time you know we got to Lesnar, you know, I didn't even consider it as, as a possibility. You know, it was Sean and. Like, I never thought Sean was going to, nobody ever thought Sean was going to win. I didn't think, or Triple H, even though um, with Triple H, there was a, a slight thing because of the idea that this could be Undertaker's last match. And if it was, then Triple H should win. But, um, you know, it was, um, 
but I, but you know i would once once that thing really got established it was more of um yeah i don't think that uh i didn't i didn't think and i don't think anyone really thought that any of these guys were beating them my last question is about wrestlemania 40 is coming up you know you've been you know reporting for years that they were considering doing rock and roman at wrestlemania and obviously yeah. this year the plans changed he's turned heel he's went all in on it did you ever think rock would 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 go all in to this degree that he has with this character um i mean before i would say no but um knowing him that weekend i thought yes i thought that um he like you know, people were going like, oh, it, it, he's he's not, I mean, many people, he's not going to want to be booed. And I just know, like, I talked to him about stuff like this. You know, I mean, I'm not close with him now, but I was. Um, and, you know, and, and, and everything, he never cared about, like, he, he, you know, if you boo him or cheer him. He was always about box office. What was the right thing? You know, it's like we it, movies, wrestling. It's his mind. I think it's from growing up as the son of a wrestler and son of a or, or grandson of a wrestling promoter. He, he, he very business, very very business. And I just thought that he's going to look at the lay of the land, and like people going like, "Oh, he's not. He's not not going to want anyone to boo him." And I go, "As long as it draws, he's not going to care if they cheer or boo him, and he's going to do. And obviously, he's going to do his best." Now, am I blown away by his performance? Yes, totally blown away. Um, I'm not saying I didn't think he had it in him. I know he did. Still totally blown away. I, I think that, um, you know, I think that this is the biggest WrestleMania in a, a long, long time. And as far as like actual viewers, it will be the biggest WrestleMania of all time in the United States. You know, more people are going to watch it this year, you know, partially because of Peacock. But but the interest level is so, so high. And, um, you know, it would have been high without him, but it's higher with him. 